just by background, if I can, first I want to go back 10 years just to very briefly summarize where we are. I want to use my experience. I've been working um, since I left my last job, uh, as well as here at the Institute, with E3G in London, which is a not-for-profit sustainability organization. And I've been working on a project for SIF and for the European Climate Foundation, looking at where the North Sea's grid project is going. And it was actually through that work that I came to a sense that the market systems we have are not working like a lot of other people, and that we're at this fundamental point or moment of change. I remember I was asked recently, I was asked, we, we've been organizing as well as that, we've organized a series of climate gatherings. And an American, one of the leading American climate policy people was there in the west of Ireland and said, so what's Europe ever done? What did you do after the, after the heat wave of 2003? And I was able to come straight back and say, we put together a radical and the most modern and most effective climate and renewables and third energy market package of measures. And I was very proud in that time to play to be one of the people involved of many in terms of the climate and energy package, starting with that uh, ETS being set up in 2005, and then that very clever trick, by my mind, not trick, but political act, by DMAS, the Environment Commissioner, and P. Boggs, the Energy Commissioner, to get the heads of state committed at an early stage in 2007 to a radical 2020 strategy, this climate and energy package and putting it at the heart of their whole political agenda. And seeing then their ability to bring those packages, climate package, renewables package, third, third package of market reforms, through the council, through the parliament, and into reality in 2009. And it was, I think, uh, a really good bit of politics at that time. Uh, and included within it, as you say, the North Sea's offshore grid, which is just one element, uh, in the strategic approach that the European Council, European Commission and Parliament were taking. It's interesting, I, I listened to Mary Donnelly last week, she was speaking in Dublin at a Euroforce meeting, and she said, if you look back even from 2009, how much has changed and how much has changed for the better? In that plan at the time, we were expecting, or there was targets being set, that for 2030, <coughs> we would see photovoltaics coming down to a price of one euro a kilowatt hour. And that's already arrived in 2012, 2013. You know, if you look at how we've actually performed in that sort of time period, the last 10 years, particularly in the electricity side, we've more problems in the heat and transport, but that sort of 4%, 5% year-on-year growth across most of the European states in development of renewable electricity, largely onshore wind as well as PV, we have really achieved a lot of the objectives that we thought we would, or that we, you know, it has, it has delivered significant investment and significant decarbonisation of the power system through that energy policy package and measures. But also, I think, if you're honest now, or if people are looking at it, and it's only started to kind of this realisation, I think, is coming into the political system in the last year, that we're starting to see some real uh, consequences of that success. We're starting to see limits of what's possible under current policy. Uh, and and the limits, for example, when you see with the scale of German renewable power generation in solar and, and, and wind on certain occasions, the spillover effect on that into neighbouring transmission systems, and the knock-on effect in terms of market price being driven right down to zero, which affects not only the investment decisions around backup other fossil fuel power plants or, or other backup <coughs> generation, but also investment in renewables itself. Or if you look, for example, the damage that was done by the Spanish political system withdrawing out in a very uh, inelegant manner from the contractual arrangements they had in support of renewables and the deep damage that was done to investment certainty uh, in renewables of, through that sort of action. Uh, or if I can maybe take the example of the uh, uh, North Sea's offshore grid, which as I said, I've been fortunate in the last year or two to visit many European capitals just talking to people about what's actually happening. Um, to take that as an example of how maybe things aren't working, how we haven't actually developed a European approach uh, to this critical electricity power market system. Um, and that's not to undermine what has been very good work that was carried on by the three working groups that were set up within that North, Sor North, North Sea offshore grid. But I think they'd all acknowledge that we still have a nationalist and still have a kind of a, a lack of political leadership in response to the opportunity that exists from power corporation and developing an integrated market. It was remarkable to hear Mary Donnelly speak last week of instances where two European regulators 
couldn't come down to the basic cooperation to allow the Cabra project to develop which was a project that was put in the European Economic Stimulus Response to the crisis five years ago, just connecting the Danish, uh, Danish and Dutch markets, which has now got to be dropped because the regulators couldn't actually come to cooperate in terms of the management of trade arrangements on it. Or again, the, uh, my example, I remember listening to what talked to one of the TSO operators in uh, Northwest Europe, uh, referring to the fact that they couldn't even get an other national government, the German in this instance, to model what the power effects would be if you allowed trade and renewables across two different states. Or again, a recent example, where TNET, the TSO in that North German area, was being driven and asked by the Commission to include the capability of the power grid they were building out into the North Seas to have mesh capabilities so that down the line they could add other lines onto it and start trading across Europe. And they point blank refused. And I guess their bankers and the, the EIB and whoever the finance part is behind that were saying, well, I don't want that, whatever, you know, that's not a big additional cost, it might only be for 5% of the facility, but I don't want to do that because what certainty do I have then of what the trading arrangements are for the renewables on that grid that I'm funding? And therefore, I just keep it simple, I'll keep it radial route into my, from the offshore uh, North Sea's uh, power uh, generation site into the single market because that may be much more expensive. That may be highly inefficient compared to a new European integrated approach, but at least I have a little bit of certainty around it. Or again, just to cite examples of how we have a problem at this present time, the fact that Mar Mary Donnelly said that the European Union had also funded a huge investment in offshore wind turbines, which were sitting on the dock rusting in Bremenhaven because there wasn't a possibility to get the agreement for the grid connection to actually put them into place. They're built, they're ready, they're paid for by the European citizens, and they're sitting on the pier. So we have a real problem, to take that one exit, maybe kind of a market area, we have that problem in that area, and we have a problem in the wider sense of trade and renewables based on success in many months, because we've now, we didn't expect maybe the multi-gigawatt uh, introduction of PV and wind of the system so quickly, and the knock-on effect that would have on the energy market. As you're saying, uh, Helen, that kind of target market model based on an energy market based on what the fuel price is, but which didn't expect you would have such a large chunk of renewables where the fuel price is irrelevant, or indeed you would have other the needs for flexibility where you need to intervene to support that renewable power system, and therefore you're let up with a market that's not real, that the actual energy, this old traditional market based on oil or gas or coal pri price no longer applies. So that's the context within, I suppose, looking back 10 years, where we've come to and where we need to go now. I want to just use a couple of slides just as kind of to help in terms of my thinking on it. The first one is just to show, I suppose, the other factor at the present day, which no one expected even five years ago, which was the effect of shale gas in the whole political uh, psyche on this issue. Um, because what clear came out of the, I, my sense of uh, listening to the sidelines of the Energy Council Ministers meeting, which occurred in Dublin earlier this summer, was that the ministers and the heads of government are fixated on the American shale gas competitive advantage. Remember here in the Institute hearing Peter Altmaier, the German uh, Environment Minister, citing the fact that they can, you know, they, they're producing energy or electricity at two cent a kilowatt hour from shale, which is just wiping the floor of anything that we can possibly produce. And I suppose that kind of figure, either for industry, European average price of 11 cents a kilowatt hour, or for households of 18 cents, compared to those figures for the US industry, 5 <coughs> cents uh, for industry, or, or 9 cents for uh, domestic users, is a fundamental issue at the heart of the debate at this present time. Now, whether those figures are accurate or not, whether those Chinese electricity prices are based on the real profitable future for Chinese utilities and indeed grid development are not, we won't know for 10 or 12, well we may know fairly soon if we find that they end up having credit difficulties, but, but um, whether the American price is fair and accurate or not, whether that carbon, or whether the full externalities in terms of methane release from the shale production, or whether even it's just a balance sheet play for some of those exploration companies, I, uh, that's a tough one to call, but we do know that it's an element in the mix in terms of why I think we've lost a certain confidence in our energy policy approach in the European Union, and we need to get it back together again in the next year and a half 
to get ready for 2015 negotiations to set our 2030 strategy in place. And I just, you can't ignore that as one of the issues that's in the back of the politicians. It's not even in the back of the politicians' mind. I think it's in the front of their mind, front and foremost. Um, the North Sea's offshore grid, I think, is one of the examples of the projects that actually can be our response. My personal, you can, people have different views, I'm not so sure we're going to be able to dig up Europe in the same way that they can dig up upstate New York or Pennsylvania and pull the shale gas out. I'm not too sure if the climate can take it. Uh, that's my personal, position, per, personal view. And I think what the alternative, in terms of what our natural, our own resources are, I think does come from renewables. And I think it comes from the sort of integration that we were committing to several years ago, but we haven't actually delivered. As I said, we're stuck in a nationalistic approach to uh, the whole energy market development. <coughs> the E3G is doing some work on this project. As I said, we, we, we just do some scoping work at the moment. We haven't completed it, but just there's some scoping work in terms of the various uh, uh, projects that are possible. And we have a lot. I mean, there, there's a whole series of NCOE devising kind of offshore grid uh, projects which could be developed. Uh, to take it very locally, I suppose we know we're looking at the possibility of Eastern, additional East West Interconnector with Ireland UK, and indeed very attractive prospect Ireland France because you get that balancing and you get north south flows that are possible uh, from such development of such infrastructure. Thank you. UK, four gigawatts of connectivity at the moment. A remarkable, like Ofgen coming out last week saying we've got a major problem and we'll run out of power and possibly in two or three years' time. No recognition within that analysis, as far as I can see, that actually interconnection could be one of the ways of giving them energy security. You know, this old, old thinking in my mind in terms of it, of the, you can't rely on the, on the French, whatever about the Irish, or the Norwegians. It sounds a bit harsh, but I think it's an indication of where, the, where we're not thinking in an interconnected way at this present time within Europe. But across this northwest region. And in my mind, the solution or the approach in Europe, we're not going to be able to get all 28 countries together into some new flexible kind of unified market. It is best to do this on a regional basis and then connect uh, at a latter stage in terms of uh, various markets, solar connecting up to the northern wind and ocean resources. Um, this project, North Seas Grid, was very much also at its formation about developing of the North Seas wind and indeed Irish seas and our Atlantic Ocean uh, energy resources. But even, as I said, separate to that, I think the grid infrastructure itself is critical because the grid infrastructure starts to give you some of that security and balancing capability that is increasingly difficult within the nationalist, the, the national market approach we take at the present time. For Germany to be able to manage its target for 2030, I don't think they can do it on an isolated Germany only basis. There, I think, Helen, was you're saying in some of the modeling that was done for the 2050 uh, projects, they were looking at least 30% of the power needs for that 2030 target coming from such interconnection from neighboring countries. And the reality is, <coughs> while there was two and a half billion, I think, approved last week within the Connecting Europe facility for some of these projects, projects of common interest, the reality is that really builds you a fraction of the interconnection points that I believe we need. And there's only in these various projects, I think there's only about three or four that are in any way, in any way, in any sort of advanced planning stage. The vast majority of that network under current policy, under current development, ain't happening until any time, sometimes significantly into the next decade. <coughs> when to a certain extent, I think our 2030 generation mix will be set. So if you delay this, and if you try and come back and retrofit it to the existing generation mix that you would have, in this interim period, you're going to get a very strange and inefficient and uneconomic solution. Um, this is a Siemens paper, and there are various other papers. There's a paper I mentioned, the European Climate Foundation, they did a very good paper for that 2050 analysis, <coughs> and they saw by 2030 a 430 billion euro benefit to the European Union by taking this integrated approach rather than a national market approach. Siemens have done some similar work and basically set out three different sort of publish, report published in May this year around you could go this on a national way, you could try and get a balanced system, or you could go for an optimum location choice. And that optimum choice does have that investment, you know, you need an investment in that grid to make it possible, 30 billion euro investment. 
but the, the savings in power generation, the optimization of efficient power generation supply sources, be it solar in the south or wind, wave, or other possible long-term power supplies, hydro in the north, see to get a net savings of 455 billion. Um, and, and we need, I believe, these sort of solutions to answer that scare around American shale gas and, what, and, and how we can be competitive. Um, if I can then, just a very general sense of where I think the politics may go from here. Um, Francois Hollande, in his kind of press conference for the second, uh, second big press conference of his presidency, um, came out and said, we now, Europe needs to lift. Europe needs to go on the offensive rather than being just constantly on the, on the defensive. And he set out very, four various areas where they might do it, youth unemployment, a number of different areas. But one of the four was development of a strong electricity and energy community in Northwest Europe and in Europe. He said, I think the lines of it said, if we, if, if we don't move now, Europe will be erased. And I think he's serious about it, and I think he's waiting for the end of the French of the German election for whatever new government, German government emerges, to actually go back to that traditional driver of European policy, French-German agreement, around the next advance in the Union. I think, and the, the Institute here has been fortunate in terms of we've been we have very interesting visit to the Potsdam Institute in Berlin. We met Professor Schellenhuber and Dr. Odenhofer and others who are involved close to German political thinking. Our sense from that is that the German government will do a deal, whoever is in power. That there is going to be, in the second half of this year, some sort of major step up in terms of European political engagement for stimulus, for integration, and for self-sufficiency. I mean, how do we answer that American shale gas competitive threat, or how do we answer the long-term security issue we have in terms of reliance on Russian gas <coughs> or other energy resources? if we're not shown to be capable and serious of actually integrating and driving a policy here. And I think, I think there's a possibility that the UK government would also buy into such a shift because, as I said, that their Ofgem report showed last week, they have a problem and they have no cheap solutions if they go on a purely nationalistic basis. And to a certain extent, perhaps on a regional approach, this North Sea's offshore grid is at 10 countries in the Northwest, you overcome some of the political difficulties that come with trying to follow a big European initiative. This is a regional initiative which is possible. And fundamentally, I suppose, this is a simple diagram which we're working on just in terms of, they work a lot on these kind of four met or matrices, kind of you can range from between a centralised market to a decentralised market, or from a European solution to a member state solution. What we have at the moment is a lot of countries heading towards a centralised and national solution. That kind of realisation in the UK <coughs> government that they have a problem because the power market has changed, one which was traditionally based on what the fuel price was, marginal price of electricity determined policy, being out of date, and it's the capital price which is now the determinant, whether it's nuclear or CCS or renewables. And so that intervention they're making there in their, in their power market reforms to actually, in a sense, very much from the centre, from the Treasury, to kind of go to that interventionist, centralised and national state approach. And you could look at various of you, a variety of European countries and apply the same analysis, that's where we're going. Where I think we need to go is towards a European and also decentralised market approach, not to abandon completely the kind of uh, benefits and advantages that you may get from full market competition and from innovation that comes if you set it up correctly. So how do we do it? I, uh, this is not easy stuff. If people had the answer to this, I was joking with Helen last night, said we'd be, we'd be sunning ourselves in the beach somewhere with a big cigar and a glass of champagne on either side, because this is tough stuff, and it's difficult policy, because things keep changing, <coughs> and uh, it's complex, complex market mechanisms, complex technology. It seems to me that there are three possible interventions that may uh, assist us meet this objective of more moving to a European and still market-based solution. One is around targets or investment certainty around grid infrastructure, interconnection development. Um, and, and I think it does have to be driven by a certain strategic. We cannot just let the market alone to determine and design a long-term transmission grid, which takes 30, 40 years in some ways to, to develop. It was interesting, I met one of the uh, engineers who designed the North Pool grid. And he said, God, it was a fantastic time. He said, the, 
no one was looking over your shoulder. You were just an engineer. You were told to go away and design the best grid for this interconnection of the northern, the Scandinavian countries. You, you kind of you were left with other engineers to work out technically how it would work. The cost of capital was zero. The risk of not being paid was zero. The level of political planning difficulties was zero. Now, we're not going to be able to do that as easily this time, but we do need, I think, a strategic intervention from a political level towards higher levels of interconnection which give us some of those balancing capabilities and which reduce the overall costs and reduces the cost of the power generation mix across the Northwest European region. And, uh, and that needs to be done with urgency. That can't be just the two and a half billion connecting Europe facility. That is not at the scale of the transition if we're really serious about decarbonizing our power system that we need to do. So that ramp up needs to occur very quickly. <coughs> and I suppose recognizing always one of the caveats and one of why this is complex recognising what John O'Sullivan and Airgrid says, right, who's doing some work around SOE on this, that DC meshed grids will not be the same as a synchronised AC system, and it still leaves us, you know, there's still complex engineering issues around how you manage uh, DC, which uh, on, on, a, on a, for example, the Irish grid, it's not giving you inertia. We've seen already with our own East-West interconnector, all sorts of complex trading arrangements can arise that you don't predict when you put in such infrastructure. But I think we have to, if we don't build that fiscal infrastructure, all the other market arrangement mechanisms are not going to work. It is a key fun fundamental driver that we need. Secondly, it's clear that we need some sort of new balancing flexibility uh, arrangement to support capital investment in, in, in new power generation that is actually centred around <coughs> this new low carbon future. That, that is, and, and that's not just an awkward or, or a kind of a, a very simple capacity payment mechanism for some you know, fossil fuel plants that might see it as a lovely way of keeping a lifeline to the, into the future. It has to be fundamentally designed to create the flexible conditions that makes this variable renewable power system work, because it is the only <coughs> large-scale power system we have available to us to counter those international competitive threats that we have. Last and not least, in fact, probably foremost, we need to really set up the market mechanisms to allow demand management to take off. All the mechanisms are now in place. The technology is advanced. I was talking to someone last night and the wonders of these new Raspberry Pi devices. I don't know if you've seen them, but this new, very slim, almost credit card sized device that gives you huge capabilities in terms of monitoring, censoring, photographing, reporting. Uh, and, and it's so cheap. 20 cents, 20 or 20 euros now, you can do something that five years ago to cost 200 or 2,000. <coughs> and taking the sort of work that Martin Curley and Intel is doing here, or Sean O'Driscoll in Glen Dimplex, and really run with it, providing them a next day trading mechanism, half hour trading mechanism for the price of electricity, um, which allows people to plan forward, allows innovators to come in and say, I'll provide you that electricity. I'll deliver the service, I'll take some of that benefit from that market flexibility that exists, that price flexibility. That's going to be key because it's not just that's key to actually managing the, the curtailment problem that's starting to develop around wind because you're taking you're pumping up demand at a time when you need it and you're cutting it back when you don't. And it shouldn't be on the bounds of possibility to set up, as I think the Commission is looking at, Europe-wide interday trading and flexibility mechanisms. Let's trade on a, on a kind of really clever basis in Europe so that our excess wind, that advantage we have in terms of this power here, powering here at a time when we want it through that grid, through very sophisticated and simple at the same time interday trading demand management mechanisms. Um, it's interesting, we were talking to Maradona, as I said at this at the Euro 4th meeting, and she came back with a very simple, straight question straight away. Yes, yeah, so how does a politician sell this to the people? How do, you, how do you explain this as a project that actually wins public support? Because that is the biggest obstacle. The biggest obstacle is, is politics. And I, I said, I don't have a huge sense, I haven't had a huge sense in the last two years of any real leadership or confidence within the European political system that we can actually take this step to a completely decarbonised power system and actually beat your American China while we're at it which I think we can. I think it's a safer, better, long-term bet for Europe to be the world leader in efficiency and in the use of flexible renewables than digging up the continent to try and squeeze the last molecule of methane out of uh, the ground and burning it and losing two-thirds of the power uh, in the transmission losses that occur from there on. 
And I think it is in some way, it's around that message about European security, Europe's future, and Europe, and, and designing the system, going back to that last, most foremost one around uh, demand management, designing this around human needs, designing it so that it's easy for someone to do it, designing that energy management system so that it's integrated in such an obvious, simple, everyday way to people's lives that it just, it's, it's like the next iPad, it's like the next iPhone. It's something which is very easy to use, which is intrinsic to everyday life, which is not a huge moral or difficult dilemma. It's actually selling this as the next step uh, in, in what you want as an individual to be able to do, to have, to share its status, uh, as well as saving you money. And it's not the beyond the bounds of our possibility in Europe, 500 million people, well educated, with good engineering companies and good utilities, to switch the whole utility model to switch the uh, power mo market model so that it starts there by people saving power, saving money, and the whole system balancing itself, balancing itself in a much clever way. I think that's part of where we need to go. Uh, that sounds very broad and laudable and very easy to say, but it is actually, I think if we, if we don't get those messages right, everything else is not gonna work.